Hi, I'm Robert Troll. Welcome to Robert's Ramblings. Today, I'm going to talk about Bass Reeves, the greatest lawman who ever lived. But before I get started, I'd like to talk about something else that I've been thinking about as I've been doing this work. There is a county in Texas, in West Texas, named Reeves County. The town of Pecos is within Reeves County. The county is named for George Reeves, a Confederate colonel and slaveholder. In fact, he was the man who enslaved Bass Reeves for most of his life. He forced Bass Reeves to fight in the Confederate Army, and Bass Reeves finally escaped servitude by going on the run and becoming a fugitive. As we are going through the process of renaming places and things that are named for people who are unworthy of those honors, I think we should consider renaming Reeves County Bass Reeves County. That way the people of Bass Reeves County would have a name that they could be proud of. Tell me what you think. I hope you agree. Now let's get on to the story at hand, the story of the fourth guardsman, Bass Reeves. I've always been a big fan of the stories of the Old West, despite the confusion, misrepresentations, and even outright lies that have been told of outlaws and lawmen alike. So much of what we think we know of those days is nothing more than fabrication. Manufactured as product, grist for the mills of dime novels and Hollywood films. Some of the false narratives, though, were from stories passed on by those who loved the legends or those who chose to ignore the truth about someone because they sympathized with them. But to make matters worse, it was and continues to be impossible to know which lawmen were the good guys and who were the bad guys because they kept changing sides and seemed to be untethered to any moral convictions. A man could be a sheriff or a Texas Ranger one day and be wrestling cattle the next. Sometimes they were on both sides at once. Despite the fact that so many lawmen like Jim Courtright and Wyatt Earp had criminal conduct and even prison terms on their resumes, there were a few lawmen who did their jobs with honor, decency, and dignity. The hanging judge of Fort Smith, Arkansas, Judge Isaac Parker, whose court had jurisdiction over the 74,000 square miles of Indian Territory from 1875 to 1889, had three such men who distinguished themselves beyond all others of the 200 deputy marshals in his employ. All, that is, except for Bass Reeves, possibly the greatest lawman who ever lived. Their fearless and relentless performance of their duties in policing the most lawless part of America earned them the name the Three Guardsmen. They were William Billy Tillman, a member of the famed Dodge City Peace Commission, Henry Andrew Heck Thomas, and Danish immigrant Chris Madsen. Together, the three lawmen were responsible for the destruction of the Doolin Dalton Gang, also known as the Wild Bunch. Chris Madsen and his posse were responsible for the killing of gang members Tulsa Jack Blake, George Bitter Creek Newcomb, and Charlie Pierce. He later tracked down and killed George Red Buck Waitman and Richard Little Dick West. Bill Tillman's greatest exploits happened earlier in his career, but he did personally capture gang leader Bill Doolin, wrestling him into submission. Doolin escaped jail six months later. Heck, Thomas finally caught up to Doolin on the road and killed him with a shotgun blast as he drew his gun. The notoriety of the three guardsmen came primarily from their systematic destruction of the Wild Bunch, since the gang's exploits were widely followed in newspapers throughout the entire country. The guardsmen were dogged and relentless pursuers. Once they picked up an outlaw's trail, they'd follow him to hell and back. They always got their man, as the old saying goes, and they are rightly revered as among the greatest lawmen in American history. The 300 felons they brought to justice between them was not the largest number of their day, but they pursued some of the most dangerous, deadly desperados, those most difficult to capture or kill, and that was partly by design. Heck, Thomas once avowed that he pursued the high-profile outlaws who brought in the most reward money. Also, they rode with a posse most of the time, so they had support when the bullets began to fly. They were the famed three guardsmen of the native territories, 
and true celebrities in their day. However, if history is to be accurate and the story told correctly, then that period in the native territory should not be remembered for the exploits of the three guardsmen alone, but rather for the four guardsmen. Bass Reeves, the first black deputy U.S. Marshal west of the Mississippi, was every bit the equal of his three comrades, and surpassed them in many ways. He mostly rode alone or with a native deputy, and was said to have brought in as many as 3,000 felons working the worst areas of the territory, the places other deputy marshals avoided. He was given those miserable assignments almost certainly due to his race. It should be known, however, the deputy marshals under Judge Parker were the most integrated and diverse police organization in the country, with a great many African American and Native Americans wearing the badge. While Tillman and Thomas were both wounded in gunfights, neither Madsen nor Reeves ever were. That is remarkable when you consider that, according to the National Park Service, as many as 120 of Judge Parker's deputy marshals were killed in the line of duty. It was a dirty, thankless, dangerous business, and it required a man of great strength and courage to take it on. Bess Reeves was such a man. Born a slave in the 1830s and growing up in Grayson County, Texas, he was allowed to learn to ride and shoot, among other skills, by his enslaver, George Reeves a sheriff, educator, and speaker of the Texas House of Representatives. Reeves refused to allow Bass to become educated, partly by preference and partly because it was illegal in those days, so Reeves never learned to read. George Reeves later joined the Confederate Army as a colonel and fought during the Civil War, forcing Bass to fight alongside him. At some point, most believe right after the Battle of Pea Ridge near Fayetteville, Arkansas, Bass escaped and fled to the Indian native territories of present-day Oklahoma. As a fugitive slave, he managed to elude his many pursuers and was taken in by Creek tribesmen. There were five tribes that had been relocated from the southeastern United States, the Creek, Seminole, Choctaw, Chickasaw, and Cherokee. Not well known was the fact that these tribes brought with them thousands of black slaves that they held. So the Creek knew African slaves well when they allowed Reeves to join their ranks. Bass made the most of his time with the Creek, learning the Creek, Seminole, and Cherokee languages. He also immersed himself in Native culture. Most believe he later fought for the Union Army in the Civil War, serving with what was then called the Union Indian Brigade, fighting mostly against pro-Confederacy Native tribesmen. Standing six foot two inches tall and purported to be enormously strong, Reeves was a crack shot with both pistol and rifle. He also learned tracking and many other useful skills from the natives. He carried two Colt 45 pistols on his hips and dressed natalie, topping off his suit with a large black hat. Once freed from slavery by the 13th Amendment to the Constitution, he was no longer a fugitive. He was recruited for service by Judge Parker's U.S. Marshal James Fagan because he was exactly the kind of man best suited to the chaos and warfare of the plains and hills of southern Oklahoma and northeastern Texas. He was resourceful, smart, courageous, and he had seen and survived combat on both sides of the war. He was a seasoned, hardened fighter, tracker, and expert pistol and rifle shot, so he could not be intimidated or bullied. Being fluent in several native languages made him impossible to pass over. I mentioned racism having a major impact on Reeves, but how could it not have? Still, he did his duty with dignity and perseverance. During these years, he was ambushed many times, engaged in many gunfights, and as said earlier, he racked up 3,000 arrests while never being wounded. He had his hat shot off twice. He personally killed at least 14 outlaws in gunfights, all in self-defense. He would sometimes wear disguises so he could infiltrate places that a marshal could not go. In so doing, he could better use his highly developed detective skills to extract information on the whereabouts of his suspects. He was known to leave a silver dollar behind as his calling card with those who helped him in the performance of his duties. Many, myself included, believe he may have and probably did inspire the character of the Lone Ranger. He wore disguises, he rode alone or with a single native companion. He left silver as a calling card. 
and most of those he arrested were sent to Detroit for incarceration. The character of the Lone Ranger first appeared in a radio series produced by a Detroit radio station. The Lone Ranger rode alone or with a single native companion. He left silver bullets as a calling card, and he often wore disguises. Sounds too familiar to be mere coincidence. And the prisoners he sent to Detroit would naturally have told their stories to other local prisoners. Thus his legend grew, and no doubt the fact that he was a black man was left out. So these racist white prisoners would not be ashamed to admit who had outsmarted them. Some even speculate that Bass Reeves may have inspired the title character of Django Unchained. Two of the more famous criminals that Reeves arrested were Sam and Bell Starr, arrested for horse theft in 1883. Bell was found guilty and sent to the Detroit House of Corrections where she served her time. The saddest case he ever handled, however, was his own son. Bass discovered that his son Benny had been charged with the murder of his wife and was still at large. It must have destroyed him to do it, but he insisted on bringing his son in, at least partly to ensure his safety. Benny Reeves surrendered to his father and was tried and sentenced to 22 years in prison. When Oklahoma became a state in 1907, racism struck again, this time costing Reeves his deputy U.S. Marshal job. Newly amended state law in Oklahoma forbid minority people from holding positions of authority in government, so Reeves had to be let go. He took on a job as a police officer in Muskogee for two years before he became ill and retired. Thus ended the career of perhaps the greatest single law officer who ever lived. He died soon after of kidney disease and slipped into relative obscurity, being eclipsed by the likes of Wyatt Earp and Bat Masterson, men of questionable character so much less worthy to be revered in our national memory. But we can change that. On the Mount Rushmore of law enforcement, let the four guardsmen ride. These are peace officers worthy of everyone's respect and admiration, and a fine example for all law officers to follow and be proud of. The fourth guardsman will live on in the memories of those who know his story, and as time passes, I believe the winds of truth will blow away the dust of the past to reveal our national treasure, Bass Reeves, for all to admire. We owe him so much more than just respect and admiration. We owe him our heartfelt apologies for the crimes we committed against him, and he should take his rightful place in history with our sincerest thanks. Bass Reeves, the fourth guardsman, surely the greatest lawman who ever lived, is only just now getting the recognition that he so rightly deserves. If you like this channel, I hope you'll subscribe and come back next time for another episode of Robert's Ramblings. Until then, so long and come on back.